to American house buyers with no chance of paying them back. Yeah, well, of course, it's easy to see that now. <laughs> but everybody in the market had confidence in absolutely, it. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, let me put it another way. Not everybody in the market had confidence in it. In fact, nobody did. The key thing is, we all behaved as if we did. <laughs> didn't it worry you that you didn't understand these things, these CDOs or the formulas? Well, of course it didn't. In fact, it would have worried me if I had. <laughs> because if I could understand it, anybody could. Not just the quantification experts who worked for me. And if anybody could, then anybody could make billions like me. And where would that leave us all? So, the point is, you believed in these things. I believed in them. And more important, I believed that everybody else believed in them. I mean, it's like religious faith. You, you don't believe in the existence of God because it's obvious. You believe in it because it's mysterious. It passes our understanding. <laughs> Certainly, these things passeth my understanding. In fact, it hurteth my mind just thinking about it. <laughs> Wouldn't it be better if there were some independent agencies which could help just set the price of these very complicated financial instruments? Well, there are. There are. There are firms like Standard & Poor's and Moody's which put a credit rating on different forms of investment and get paid a fee. Now, who pays their fee? Whoever is selling the investment. <laughs> Isn't there a huge conflict of interest there? I mean, surely there's a massive temptation for fraud, mm. uh, giving a top credit rating to things which didn't deserve it. Well, certainly, when it came to these uh, things like CDOs and SIVs, the agencies consistently gave AAA ratings to what the Financial Times called grotesque risk monsters. <laughs> but I don't think fraud was involved. Well, why did they do it then? Well... The analysts who work for the credit rating agencies aren't very well paid. They get very small bonuses, so all the smart people left for the banks and the hedge funds. So, as the FT once again said, leaving second-rate employees to rate complex deals they didn't understand. So, uh, you're saying it wasn't criminal, it was stupidity. Stupidity and incompetence, that's all. <laughs> and that's something we can be very proud of. <laughs> What happened to the system where a, a banker actually got to know the person wanting a loan and made a judgment about how risky the loan was likely to be? Isn't that a better way of doing business? Oh, my goodness, no, all that went out with the ark. You can never make any serious money doing things like that. And the market's far too big. Have you ever heard of credit default swaps? Uh, no, vaguely. But they're a very ingenious way of ensuring against companies defaulting on loans. At the end of 2006, the market in credit default swaps was $54 trillion dollars. That's two-thirds the size of the total global economy. And the point of them is what? To decrease the risk of a crisis in financial markets. Well, did they work? No. <laughs> As it turned out, they actually increased the risk of a global financial crisis. So where did it all start to unwind? Mm. What happened? Uh, didn't you have any inkling that something was about to go terribly wrong? Well, what everybody thought was, uh, it didn't really matter if things went wrong, or if we made mistakes, or if people defaulted on their mortgages. Why not? Because property values would go on rising and all the mistakes would be cancelled out. <laughs> now, I've been working in the city for 40 years, and if I've learned nothing else, and I have learned nothing else, <laughs> it is there is an absolute rule that property values never go on rising forever. That's the rule. That's an Is absolute it? rule. They never have and they never will. Only a complete idiot would think otherwise. Right. Except <laughs> that just this once we thought they would. <laughs> <laughs> but the American housing market began to collapse and that affected all those complex financial instruments, the CDOs and the SIVs. Indeed. Sales of asset-backed CDOs fell from $227 billion last year to less than a billion this year. Well, why did it happen so suddenly? Because some idiot somewhere asked a question that should never have been asked. Which was what? Which was, how much are these things worth? <laughs> and then the whole thing unraveled. <laughs> yeah, it makes you weep, doesn't it? <laughs> if they'd have kept quiet, things might have just gone on as they were. Oh, for the good old days. So, uh, George Parr, as an investment banker, how do you think we're going to get through this crisis? Well, of course, it depends who you are. If you're holding a mortgage or if you're on middle to low income, then, of course, you're stuffed. 
So, what's going to happen to you and to your bank? Uh, there's a rumour going around that you're going to be taken over by a Spanish bank. Yes, it's a possibility. It will be a very, very sad day. It will mean I have nothing to look forward to except a compensation payment of £12 million and a £5 million pension fund. <laughs> Isn't that rather a lot of money to pay someone who, after all, did so much damage to his company? Well, we can all understand big rewards for success, but this, this is a reward for failure. Oh, no, no, it's not a reward for failure. It's compensation for failure. <laughs> and they probably think it's worth paying £12 million to stop me doing whatever I was doing to the company. <laughs> So, why are Spanish banks in particular in a position to buy up other companies? I mean, earlier in the year, we saw Alliance and Leicester bought by Santander. Uh, didn't they lose money on these toxic financial products? No, the bloody Spanish bloody didn't, and for one very good reason. Spanish banks aren't allowed to hold CDOs or SIBs and things like that. It's against their law. So, I have one question. Why wasn't it against our law for British banks to hold them? <laughs> if it had been, we wouldn't have lost all this money on them. It's very, very unfair. <laughs> so, you would approve of tighter regulation for the city? I didn't say that. I didn't say that. <laughs> Self-regulation is the answer. You mean there will be no more investment in CDOs and SIVs? Absolutely. We wouldn't touch them with a the barge bowl today. Although there are some things, some new things coming into the city which everybody's getting very enthusiastic about. You're not serious. What thing? They're called re-remixes. <laughs> Re-remixes? Re -re uh, yes, I, uh, I'm not making this up. Re-securitizations of real estate mortgage investment conduits. <laughs> it's where you take a lot of mortgages, you chop them up, you put them into bonds and mix up the bonds and trade them. You see, o uh, over $9.3 billion worth of re-remixes were created this year. But they sound just the same as CDUs. Oh, no, they're completely different. Well, <laughs> well, actually, they're nearly the same, but there are crucial differences. The mortgages won't be ones sold to people with no income. Well, that's a relief. Just to people who can't prove their income. <laughs> well, I'm sorry, it sounds as though you haven't learned any lessons at all. It sounds as though the whole merry-go-round will start again with people in the city and on Wall Street thinking they're going to make money out of nothing. Not at all, no. We know there's absolute rule in the city that you can't make money out of nothing. Never? Never, ever. Only a complete idiot would think otherwise. Except? Except just this once. <laughs> we think we might. The truth about the distribution of wealth under American capitalism makes Karl Marx the world's worst prophet. Marx, the socialist founder of communism, prophesied that under capitalism, wealth would be concentrated in the hands of fewer and fewer, while the great majority of people would suffer increasing poverty. The fact is that American capitalism has set a new standard for human welfare. And if we keep its basic principles strong and vigorous in the years ahead, the opportunity of every American for a still better living standard will certainly be enhanced. And perhaps even the disciples of socialism and communism will come out of their shadowy pipe dreams and join us in our march of human progress.